from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression with me, Jerry Baker, from the Wall Street Journal editorial page. We're delighted you're listening to this podcast. If you enjoy it, please be sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. And please be kind enough to leave us a favorable review. Now, the journal's editorial page, we believe strongly in free expression. And each week, we explore in depth and candor on this podcast issues of topical and other interest. We speak in depth to people who are leading figures in their field, practitioners, experts, commentators, to try to give us a better understanding of the major issues of our times. Now, our topic this week is the Supreme Court particularly in the light of the extraordinary leak of the deliberations of the court in the case of Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health, a case that could overturn the 1973 ruling on abortion of Roe v. Wade. My guest is Jonathan Turley, lawyer, legal scholar, writer and professor at George Washington University Law School. Professor Turley, of course, is a distinguished practitioner in and commentator on constitutional law and legal theory, among other things. In addition to his extensive writing and public speaking, he's testified on many occasions before Congress, including during some impeachment proceedings. As an attorney, he's worked on many notable cases in the field of civil rights, as well as on national security and military law. Jonathan Turley, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Let me just start. I want to get into the details. You've spoken a lot, and I want to get into more details about the leak itself and then also about the future of Roe v. Wade from what we've learned in the last week or so. Let me just start. You wrote a a very interesting piece this weekend in which you talked about the nation's addiction to rage. And it, it is very striking that we seem to be in an age now when whatever your views, whatever your political views, we no longer seem to rely on sort of procedural formalities that we're used to to get things done. We no longer rely only on those and that there's an increasing interest in, if you like, direct action, breaking the norms, breaking the rules, challenging the existing procedures that we normally have. And this late Supreme Court leak is obviously one of the most extraordinary examples of that. It seems as though we live in an age where what matters is winning above all else, however you do it, and ignoring the rules and the norms. Again, you wrote about that today. Why do you think that is? Well, there's certainly a a type of release, even a license that comes with rage. People feel that any means will justify the ends. And you can see that in the actions and the voices that we see on the news. You have people on television literally screaming into the camera. And that's what really makes you think if we are a nation addicted to rage, that we don't want to admit it, but we like it. And that is a real dangerous point for any country to be in. And when we look at this leak, it was a defining moment when the president of the United States could not muster the courage to say this is wrong, whether it's done by a conservative or a liberal, a justice or a clerk, it's wrong. It shattered centuries of tradition. It violated every possible ethical rule. And yet at that moment, the president of the United States could not bring himself to stand against this mob. And it's not just that you have a collapse of leadership. It's that we are sort of unmoored as a nation from these foundational principles that are supposed to guide us. What impact do you think this leak has? We saw Chief Justice Roberts condemn it very strongly and last week and say he would begin an investigation into who leaked it and how this happened. People have talked about the loss of trust among members of the court and their clerks and their staff. How big of an effect will this have in terms on the ability of the court to continue to do its job going forward? I think it's going to have a significant impact because the court has always rested on the assumption that no one would betray the institution in this way. The assumption has been validated uh, for so many decades. That's now been shattered. I mean, there's a sense of a loss of innocence on the court You know, I teach a a course on the Supreme Court, and I told my students I I couldn't think of anything that is more destructive for the court because this is a human-centric enterprise. You can't treat this like a national security installation. There is a collaboration that goes between the justices and the clerks. Drafts go through many, many different versions as they try to get it right. You can't turn that into a national security skiff. I mean, they have to have a flow of information that requires trust. And so that's what I think was shattered here. And I'm not too sure how they put it back together. Quite frankly, I was surprised that Chief Justice Roberts turned to the court's own police force rather than the FBI 
either they know or think they know who the culprit is, or that's a really bad decision. I mean, the FBI is the world's expert on computer and forensic investigations. I can't imagine why the chief justice would not bring in the FBI to make short work of this. Is it a crime? I think it is a potential crime. You know, many people have said, well, this is a crime because it's obstruction. But to make out an obstruction crime, you have to show the intent was to influence a proceeding. And yeah, this could be viewed as trying to coerce justices to change their minds, but it also could just be an intent that's directed outward to create a political movement. That would not necessarily be obstruction. So it, it would be a difficult case to make without having greater information. The other thing is that it could be a type of theft of government property. Once again, that's stretching the criminal code. The easiest crime to make out is lying to federal investigators under 18 U.S.C. 1001. That's the common crime charged in scandals in Washington. And that's the reason I was a little surprised that Chief Justice Roberts didn't call in the FBI. They should have gone to all 36 clerks and asked them one question. Did you leak the opinion? And when all of them say no, you have a crime by definition, if it's one of the clerks that did it. This is speculative, obviously, and there are all kinds of theories as to who and why it might have been leaked. But given that we've seen the reaction, and we'll talk a bit more about this as we go on, we've seen the reaction from, as you say, from the president and the White House, from members of Congress, from members of the public, and we'll also talk about the extraordinary scenes outside some of the justices' houses over the weekend. Given what you've seen... What's your sense of, of maybe whoever did this, what they were trying to achieve? Well, that's an excellent question. I think that the evidence doesn't really give us much of an indication. There could have been a couple of different motivations here. I'm still surprised that anyone familiar with the court would believe that leaking this opinion would change the position of the justices. It's more likely that it would have the opposite impact, that they would dig in to show they're not yielding to the mob. But beyond that, there, it's really hard to say. You know, I, I wrote a blog piece today on Nina Totenberg coming out saying that the only theory that makes sense is that the conservatives did it and that the most likely theory is that it was a conservative clerk. And I know that I, I have no idea why that makes sense at all. There's motivations on both sides. It could have been a liberal clerk who wanted to trigger a political response, including the potential passage of the codification of Roe v. Wade in Congress. It's impossible when someone takes such a reckless act to assume motivations. It could have been a conservative. It could have been a liberal. What's clear is that whoever did it violated the most fundamental ethical principles of our profession. That's what should have been the focus of the White House, and the president should have condemned it. Do you think the authority of the court has been damaged by this action? I'm not too sure the authority has. I think the greatest damage is within it. It is that loss of innocence. It is that sense of unease that people can go rogue, even on an institution that is so small. I mean, this is an almost monastic environment. It's insular. It is based on this intense bond to the institution of the court. And in past decades, that has been enough. You know, this is not the first divisive case. It's not the first case that sort of falls at ground zero of national politics. But no one has ever done anything like this. Now, we've had some leaks from the court. That's occurred. It's relatively rare for a city that floats on leaks. This has always been an island of relative secrecy and confidentiality, but we have never seen anything like this. This is an incredibly hostile act by someone within their ranks. So the next thing we've seen, of course, again, is uh, over the weekend demonstrations outside what are believed to be the houses of uh, at least two of the justices and uh, some suggestion, indeed, some reports that uh, at least one of the justices, Sam Alito, may have actually gone into hiding. Some people have said this is actually unlawful, that it represents an attempt you know, against, um, you'll know the exact US code reference, but it's in violation of the US code that makes unlawful attempts to demonstrate with judges in an attempt to influence their decision. What's your sense of what you've seen, whether it's appropriate, unlawful, how do you view that? Well, it can be a crime under 18 U.S.C. 1507, and that is uh, a crime of protesting. They're the residence of a judge or jury as well as other facilities 
with the intent to influence the proceedings. This could fit that if the motivation of the protest is to intimidate the justices to change their mind. As a free speech advocate, I would be very concerned about the use of that statute. I think that what these protesters are doing is reprehensible. I think it's equally reprehensible for President Biden not to denounce this. But when we start to charge protesters with crimes because they're appearing at the homes of figures, including Supreme Court justices, you really do raise some First Amendment concerns. I mean, is the motivation there to get them to change their mind? Or is it just rage? What I see is just rage. I mean, that actually makes it worse in many respects. I don't think they're trying to achieve anything but harassment and retaliation. But I do think that if you brought a prosecution, it would raise some serious constitutional questions, and I would not bet on that being upheld on appeal. Let's look at the substance now of the leak. Again, you know the procedures at the court. What we were told last week in the leak, so it was a political story last week, was that five justices had already voted an initial vote to overturn Roe v. Wade in this Dobbs case. And of course, we were leaked the draft opinion by Justice Alito. Give us a sense of the procedure here, because of course, that's in no way final. They take an initial vote, then they back and forth opinions. That draft opinion was dated back in February. Where were we in this process and how close to final is what we've seen so far in that draft opinion. Well, it's funny. When this first broke, I got a call from a producer, and I was immediately dubious about the story, uh, particularly because they thought that Roberts was the author of the opinion. I said, that's not what some of us expected. We expected Roberts to, at most, be a concurrence. And then the call came back a few seconds later saying, no, it's Alito. And I said, well, now I'm worried uh, because (laughs) it does make sense that we all expected that Roberts would try to pull a couple of justices, likely Kavanaugh and Barrett, into a concurrence to fracture the court so that there would not be a clear rejection of Roe, but maybe increasing the power of the states. If he did that, then he would not assign the majority opinion uh, that would likely uh, then go to Thomas. But Thomas may already be writing a major decision. There's a November decision on guns that has still not been published. There's only two people in November that have written an opinion, Thomas and Barrett. So it does sort of track with what might have happened. And looking at the opinion, it did certainly, as I said, that moment, it does read like Alito. It's, it's his style. Now, what does that mean for February? Well, it it, it means that you had at least a five-justice majority with a possible single concurrence for Roberts to either overturn or limit Roe. Can opinions change? Yes. The most likely change is not that the Alito opinion will change necessarily dramatically. Alito is sort of baked in on this issue. But it can't change in becoming a plurality. It can even change in becoming a dissent, which seems unlikely. But if Roberts were able to pull away Kavanaugh or Barrett, you would have that fracturing of a decision, the potential for a plurality decision. And then Roe may live to fight another day, depending on what the plurality is. So all of that can happen. There is a lot of changes that occur in drafts. This was a long time ago. The only issue here that makes me wonder how much this could change is that this is a case of really first principles. And one thing I've said about the Trump justices, the nominees by President Trump, is that they tend to be people of first principles, particularly Gorsuch and Barrett. They tend to go back to what they believe are the founding intent and also not just what the drafters intended, but the role of the court to reinforce that. So it may not change that much. It is fascinating to watch Robert's role in all of this. This has been a rough week. Many conservatives have been angry with Roberts in the past because he tends to get sticker shock. He did that on the individual mandate. You know, he wrote this magnificent federalism part of the opinion saying this is a clear violation of states' rights. And then the next section, he basically shrugged and said, unless we call it a tax, which, by the way, no one was calling it, and then it's okay. That really was perhaps the worst opinion he's ever written because it was so clearly almost an afterthought. It was a disjuncture in his opinion and his style. But he's done that before. He's an incrementalist. He's an institutionalist. He doesn't like the court bringing about sweeping changes in society. 
But here he's up against his colleagues who really do believe that, apparently from this opinion, that this is something that was created by the court. And there's only so much compromise you can get from a justice who starts from that position. And it did look from oral arguments that we remember back late last year, and we could actually hear them, Roberts did seem to be trying, in most people's judgment, to carve out a kind of middle way in which he wanted to find a way to uphold the Mississippi law, which uh, which I think imposes a restriction on abortion beyond 15 weeks, but without rejecting completely and without overturning the principles of Roe v. Wade. It did look like that. Do you suspect that has been what's going on and that may be what has still been going on after this February draft opinion? I have no doubt that uh, Roberts is still trying to coax Kavanaugh and Barrett to a concurrence. Kavanaugh is the one that I always thought would be more susceptible because he's very much like Roberts. I wrote a column where I was so much mirthful because Trump said that he appointed Kavanaugh because he didn't want another Roberts. And I wrote a column saying, you could search the country over and not find someone more like John Roberts. I mean, in terms of his background, even his writing style, it would be impossible unless you cloned John Roberts. They went to the same high school, didn't they? <laughs> exactly. And, you know, but Kavanaugh is a little more conservative in terms of consistency. But there's reason to, for Roberts to think that he could coax him to a concurrence. And I'm sure he's still doing that. And do you think Kavanaugh is particularly, do you think he's sensitive to the criticism? We very interesting last week. I mean, as soon as this news came out, we had, I think, Susan Collins, maybe Lisa Murkowski, who had voted obviously for Kavanaugh, citing his testimony during his nomination hearing that he regarded Roe v. Wade as a settled law. And now the kind of, you know, when they came out last week, uh, very directly condemning what they think this decision will be and Kavanaugh's role in it. Do you think that would weigh with him? I, I don't think so. I wrote a column saying that the allegations that three justices committed perjury in their confirmation hearing is utter nonsense. It was repeated by Gildebrand this weekend. It is utter nonsense. That is, if you go back and look at what they said, they were giving legal truisms. They were saying Roe v. Wade is settled law. Yeah, it is. Roe v. Wade is binding precedent. It is until you overturn it. But they also said we will not make a statement as to how we will vote in future cases. The language they used is virtually identical to all the Democratic nominees. So this is entirely made up. There's absolutely no basis to say that they testified untruthfully in those hearings. But whether or not that's true, again, one of the effects of this leak is before presumably a final decision is reached, we don't even know that, I suppose, but before a final decision has been reached, this widespread political pressure. You, you said earlier you don't think it's likely to sway justices' opinions, but they're not now operating in a vacuum, are they? They are, are operating against this kind of operatic background of dissent, protest, pressure, you still think they'll resist attempts to get them to change their votes? Well, I have no question that these protests will have no impact at all on those five justices. These are people of principle. And this is a historic vote. It may be the most important vote that they ever take as jurists. They're not going to yield to the mob. I mean, that's one of the reasons why, you know, this idea that maybe a conservative is trying to lock them in by unleashing the mob and it's sort of getting them to stand up to the mob by standing firm that's always a possibility. The motivations of a totally unbalanced person are rather hard to predict. The only thing that I can predict is if we ever find whoever it is, then God have mercy on their soul because we will have none. I mean, hopefully that person will be disbarred in short order. If it's someone on the left, I expect they will be lionized as they already have on the left. If it's someone on the right, I don't think there's much of a future for that person. We're going to take a short break there, but when we come back, we'll have more with Jonathan Turley on the Supreme Court. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're talking with Professor Jonathan Turley about the Supreme Court, Roe v. Wade, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, and the state of the American Constitution and politics in general. How likely is it that that, again, that draft Alito opinion that we saw that was dated back in February, how close is that likely to be to the majority, to the final opinion that we see written by, presumably it will be Alito, to that final majority opinion when it is actually delivered? That's a draft, obviously, and then presumably his concurring colleagues will have input into that and change it. I mean, is it likely to change significantly in terms of what we've seen in the past? I don't expect him to change it much. He tends not to do that. Alito writes in a very direct, often a largely reduced way. Um, he's not given to flourish or long opinions. 
he cuts to the chase. But this reads to me like an opinion that sets the initial bid when it comes to the court. It goes as far as you could possibly go. And in that sense, he may be testing where Barrett and Kavanaugh are with the understanding that there might be a little room here for him to step back on. But the problem is that I don't see where you can move very far off the premise of the opinion without just completely changing it. I mean, either this right is found in the Constitution or it is not. If Roe was based on a judicial creation, then so was Casey. And it's hard to escape that analysis. But the opinion itself, because of its language, struck me as sort of an initial bid. Uh, so that may be tapped down a bit. But also, I think the biggest change is that Kavanaugh or Barrett may decide that they don't want to sign on to such a strong opinion. But then where do they go from there? I mean, what Roberts was offering an oral argument was that maybe we just need to dump the viability line, increase the ability of states to impose limits like in Mississippi so that they can go ahead and ban abortion after 15 weeks or so or the so-called quickening uh, that was used in common law. That would be the backup. But you still would only get there if you believe that there is some protection over the right of abortion within the Constitution based on this privacy rationale. From your perspective, again, from a sort of conservative perspective, I read it, I'm not a lawyer, but lots of law conservative jurists that I've spoken to, so they thought it was pretty sound in terms of, and again, conservatives have long argued that Roe v. Wade was a very badly decided, not just conservatives, by the way, I mean, as, as, as eminent a liberal a progressive jurist as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of course, famously said that it was flawed in many respects. In your judgment, does it look like a pretty sound opinion to you? And I know he talked about you know, obviously the absence of any evidence of a right to abortion or indeed privacy in the Constitution, but also going into the details of sort of, you know, the, the idea of ordered liberty and the importance and, and the rights that could be discovered, if you like, from those kind of traditions in the American jurisprudence and finding none of them to justify the rights that were asserted in Roe v. Wade. What's your overall take of that 80-page opinion from Alito? Well, first of all, I think people are being grossly unfair when they, a lot of uh, professors and other experts are just declaring that this is something medieval and completely absurd. It's not. I mean, this is a perfectly valid, good faith view of the Constitution. It's also a dramatic misrepresentation of the history of Roe v. Wade. The court has never been on terra firma uh, when it comes to Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade itself is dead. It was replaced effectively by Casey. It wasn't overturned, but Casey gutted it. And that shows you what the faith they had in the analysis of Roe. And when they gutted it, they replaced it with this undue burden standard, which sort of came out of the head of Zeus. You know, they just created it and said, you can't oppose an undue burden, whatever that means. And ever since then, we have been wallowing and trying to figure out what is an undue burden and what is not. So there is ample reason for people to question the existence of an abortion right. I have a more robust view of privacy of the Constitution than does Alito. In that sense, I'm more libertarian. I do think the Constitution protects privacy interests. But the basis of Roe has been questioned even by people on the far left. I mean, Lawrence Tribe called it a smokescreen. As you noted, Ginsburg herself said it went too far and she regretted it that they didn't do something a little more modest. Um, and also, Alito was correct that not much has changed. The country hasn't come together. People refer to polls showing that when you ask, should you overturn Roe v. Wade, a, a very strong majority says no. Well, it depends how you ask the question, because in one of those same polls that had that result, they said, do you think uh, abortion could be made illegal? And it's split right down the middle. But when you ask, you know, do you think that states can ban abortion after 15 weeks? There is a strong majority in favor of that. And then the Democrats have other problems. You'll notice in the last few days, they've been avoiding questions about how far their rationale goes. They say that there should be no limits on abortion. Well, they've been asked, does that mean you can abort a baby the day before they were delivered, a fully formed baby in the ninth month? Some have said yes that, you know, it's up to the mother in consultation with the doctors. The American people are wholeheartedly against that. 
So this thing is going to break a lot of China, and I'm not too sure how it breaks for the midterms. It's really going to depend on how people frame it. You know, the Democrats, I think, did get the initial boost from the leak. But they're now going to be asked, you know, if anyone in the media really does press them, but they should be asked, when you say there's a right of abortion, what does that mean? And if you say there's limits to abortion, then why can't states limit them? And to what extent can they limit them? Those are the details that are not being pressed by the media. In the time we have remaining, I want to look at that exactly. So what is the frame? It's a big if, I accept. But if the opinion that comes down in a month or so is pretty close to what we've seen so far from in that draft opinion from Alito and the decision of the court is to strike down Roe v. Wade. What's the legal and political framework in which abortion will operate? We have these many of these, I think 13 states have these trigger laws that will supposedly go into effect immediately if Roe v. Wade is struck down, most of which effectively outlaw abortion, except in some very extreme cases. Other states have got statutes or planned or legislation similar to what Mississippi has. We're going to have this patchwork. Some states have a very permissive approach to abortion, obviously California, New York. But how will it work? Is that what we will have? We will have 50 different abortion frameworks in the country? Or will there be either a federal at the congressional level, some sort of legislative attempt to regulate abortion? Or could it still come back to the federal courts? Is there still a federal interest, if you like, in determining what abortion rights are? Give us your overview of what that will look like. Well, starting with the last question, there is, of course, a codification of Roe that is being sought through legislation in Congress. I don't think they have the votes because of the filibuster. There's also an effort by people like uh, Susan Collins to create something more modest in terms of a federal standard. Those things can be challenged. There are other constitutional concerns raised. You know, the court here is saying that this properly belongs with the states. I think that Congress could make out a persuasive basis for saying there's interstate commerce here to justify jurisdiction. But there's other constitutional challenges. That's the reason I was surprised when Mitch McConnell came out a couple of days ago and said, yeah, we could go ahead and ban it nationally. I was surprised both legally and politically that he would say that. Now, in terms short of that type of measure or an effort to create, for example, an equal protection basis for a federal right in the courts, you will have this return to the states. And the thing that people need to keep in mind is that I think that it's perfectly clear at this point that even without overturning Roe, you would have had a patchwork system because I think the Mississippi law was going to be upheld. So there would have been states that imposed the 15 week limit. I think that what you're likely to have is sort of groups of three or four in terms of states completely protecting it, some banning it. And then in the middle, you have things like this 15 week option that may appeal to some purple states. But the point here is that it would be left up to the states and the democratic process. Now, having said that, of the 30 or so states where abortion would be protected, that's where the majority of Americans live. So um, we'll have to see how this sorts out. Corporations have stepped in to say that if you're in a state that bans abortion, they will pay for travel and abortion services in another state. There's also discussions of using federal facilities in a state uh, that would not be subject to state authority. So there's a lot of road ahead of us. But the idea that abortion would be unlawful in the United States is clearly, I think, not going to happen. Most American citizens, their state will protect abortion. And for those that do not, they will be left with the option of going to another state or possibly a federal option if Congress creates it. To be clear, again, under uh, it's very tentative, but what we've seen so far of the draft opinion, if you're a woman who lives in a state, say one of these states that, that does have very restrictive rules, some states don't even allow for the exception of rape or incest. They only allow for the – in the case of – the mother's life being at mortal risk. But so if you're a woman in one of those states where abortion is essentially completely banned, would there be any recourse to federal courts at all from what you've seen in this draft? Or would it simply be, no, this is, you know, if you live in Louisiana, you know, the Louisiana is completely free to determine its own rules as regard to abortion. There is no federal interest. There's no federal recourse at all. Other than legislation, I mean, obviously, congressional legislation. Yeah. Yes. I mean, short of legislation, um, there was always an argument, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually referred to this once, about an equal protection claim for abortion, that this was really a discrimination based on gender. And that, I would expect, would be a claim brought fairly quickly in federal courts to see if there's a basis for that. 
the other options there would be legislative. So if you do not have a new equal protection or some other constitutional footprint uh, for the right, then yes, uh, women in Louisiana would have to go to another state. And that would create a considerable burden because it's fine if you're working for Amazon or Twitter and they'll pay for it. But the people most impacted will be those that are not working, obviously, for major corporations. And they're in Louisiana and they don't have any good option if they're seeking abortion services. And Democrats obviously reacted with a lot of outrage to this. And once again, they've raised the possibility of court packing. Obviously, they need to abolish the filibuster to do that. They don't have the votes to do that at the moment in the Senate. But do you see possibly the longer term implications of this being something that could quite radically change the way in which the court works, the way in which the judiciary works? I mean, is this, again, this sort of what we talked about at the beginning, this kind of resort to rage that people have and the political process becoming so infected by this kind of desire to win at all costs. Do you think this could have long-term implications or do you think there will be a kind of a cooling off and people will say, you know, we'll see how this works out rather than, you know, in other words, is this an escalation of this tendency towards more and more radical solutions to our problems or do you think it could mark a kind of a pause or even a step back from that? I think it is an escalation. You know, it depends on what happens with the midterm elections. I mean, if the trajectory played out, um, you would expect some moderate Democrats would have fallen away. That'll reduce a core of the more extreme Democrats on the left in the Democratic Party, but their numbers would be reduced. How this changes that, I'm not sure. But we can expect that the hue and cry for court packing will continue. It has been a disgrace. How many law professors have supported court packing? How many members of Congress, including Elizabeth Warren, demanding court packing? And they're demanding not the expansion of the court, the rigging of the court. They're demanding an immediate expansion to give a liberal majority. Uh, It is something that at one time would have been a cause of shame for any member of Congress to state. But it's part of what we're dealing with here, that no institution, no value, isn't violate anymore. It reminds me of this cleric who was one of the key figures in the French Revolution, and then he found himself threatened as they the French Revolution turned inward and started to execute its own. And he was asked years later what he did during the terrors, and he simply responded, I survived. With Justice Alito reportedly in hiding, you sort of think back to that quote, Are we all just going to look back at this period and consider it a victory that we survived? That is a good note, a slightly depressing note and a slightly alarming note, maybe even to end this podcast. But uh, Professor Jonathan Turley of George Washington University, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. That's it for this week's episode of Free Expression with me, Jerry Baker, from the opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal. Thanks very much for listening. Please do join us again next week for another exploration of the issues that drive our world. Thank you very much and goodbye. Goodbye.